A crisis of faith overcoming pride. Luke chapter 4. Lucy was a strong believer in Christ, but she got really sick with cancer and was hospitalized. Ricky, her husband, loved her dearly, but he was an unbeliever. He had always heard people praying to God and the sick being healed, but he was always a bit skeptical. He didn't think there was enough proof to believe in God. And the idea of someone rising from the dead was just preposterous. However, in this very difficult situation, watching his wife suffer with cancer, he decided that if God is real, this was his chance to prove himself. Ricky prayed a very skeptical prayer to God for healing. He said, God, if you're there and if you care, heal my wife. But if you don't, then I guess I'll have my answer about you. You see, Jesus was in the wilderness, and he was tested and tempted by Satan. We know that Jesus was not actually tempted in the desert. We discussed that in depth the past few weeks. He does not desire to do evil. Nonetheless, Satan tried to trip him up and make him fall, and he experienced three temptations. First temptation was turning stones into bread. The second one was to reign over the earth if he worshiped Satan. And the third that we're going to discuss today is to display the Lord's power wrongfully. But if you read 1 John chapter 2, if you turn to that slide for me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. You see, these three things that John describes correlate very well to the three temptations Jesus experienced. Turning stones in the bread, it was like the lust of the flesh, appealing to his desires of this flesh. The lust of the eyes that we talked about last week correlates to the worship of Satan if he bowed down and he would achieve the authority of the world. The last temptation of Jesus that we are going to discuss today is the pride of life. The pride of life refers to arrogant boasting, whether it be in one's possessions, one's position, or one's power. And this is what we'll see Satan's ploy was for Jesus. So if you would stand with me as we read our scripture today, don't worry, we're going to pull together that story about Ricky and Lucy later on in the message. You hold on to that. Luke chapter 4 verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was very hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. But Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point on the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Lord, I do thank you for your word. I pray that you would clearly express your word to us today. I pray that you'd use me, Lord, as unskilled and unprofessional as I am, Lord. I'm unworthy to share your gospel, God, but you have commissioned it to us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to understand your word. Use me as your vessel, your vocal cords, your mouthpiece today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Temptations have a way of stealing 
our focus from eternity and putting it on the here and now and gratifying ourselves now. Would you agree? Let me try that again. Temptations have a way of stealing our focus away from eternity and focusing on here and now. Agree? Okay, thank you. I just needed to wake y'all up a little bit. They blind us. Temptations blind us to the reality that there is no consequences for our actions. The lure of sin appears so rewarding and self-gratifying that we momentarily forget that we as believers in Christ are to abandon ourselves. Pride is a huge lure in temptation. And when we encounter the temptation appealing to pride, it is a crisis of faith. Will your faith in Christ overcome your pride? Let's learn about that today. See, the devil is very sneaky. And oftentimes, he goes around the backside so he avoids getting noticed so that he can tempt us without us ever being aware of his presence. But to identify and overcome the lure of pride, we need to do two simple things. Stop and think. Because in our fast-paced society, we are, we are so ingrained just to go, 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 go. And we, we get so going that we trip up because we're just not thinking. We're not stopping and thinking and absorbing and noticing the things that are around us. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in a temptation, and especially that of pride, because we're just so prone to it. And if we don't slow down, we're going to fall face first. So if we just simply stop and think, that will avoid a lot of the temptations for us. And we can notice them and identify them. But what are we to stop and think about? I'm going to give you a few different things. We need to first stop and think about the depth of our sinful nature compared to God's holiness. God is, is so holy. And sometimes we don't even recognize the holiness of God because we're just assuming, like, well, he's imperfect. Everybody's imperfect. There's no one perfect. We don't even have a great concept of what perfect is. Because we are so, the sin is so ingrained in us. It's hard for us to even separate ourselves mentally from it. Or even imagine a world where there is no sin. But our sinful nature corrupts us so deep that we can't see the holiness of God, so we must humble ourselves before Him. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord's glory, in the temple, in a spiritual way, the spiritual heavenly temple, he fell down and said, I am unworthy to be here. Woe is me, he said. The disciples, when they saw Jesus being transfigured and they saw a part of the Shekinah glory of God, they fell down and were fearful and wanted to worship him. John was seeing the glorified Jesus in Revelation, fell down, face down before the Lord. Are you willing to even go face down before your Savior? Are you willing to go face down before the Lord? Is there anything in which you would actually bow your face down to? What did your pride say? No, I ain't doing that. We might want to stop and think about our sinful nature compared to the holiness of God. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 says, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. In the same way, look at this, in the same way, you, are t you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord's mighty hand, under the Lord's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. God is holy. And for us to have any kind of relationship with this God, we must humble ourselves. Humbleness is a sign of holiness. Number two, stop and think about the source of all good things. You know, a quarterback may take pride in himself that he threw a touchdown pass. But he did, did he act alone? No, he needed a good receiver to catch the pass. He needed a good offensive line to protect him so that he could throw the pass. He needed a good coach to tell them the right play so that he could make the right pass. 
Amen? He did not act alone, but in his pride he may think so. A CEO of a corporation may brag about how she has brought this company to new ends and new, new heights. But did she act alone? No, she needed employees to make it happen. She needed all the pieces to be in place to make it happen. God is the source of every blessing we have. Amen? James 1.17 says, All good things come from Him. All good things come from Him. When we are tempted to boast in ourselves, we forget just how much God has done and how much He is working on our behalf. We act as if we did it all. It was me. Look at me. Our pride can blind us to the work of God in our lives. And our pride replaces God with our own. The temptation of Adam and Eve, you remember? What's the ploy that Satan says? Don't you want to be like God? He was appealing to their pride. Number three, we need to stop and think about our status in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with what? Your bodies. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body of, the, of Christ. The collective body of Christ. But when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in you. Personally. You possess the Holy Spirit. He is in your heart. Right? You become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is our status in Christ. We are not our own. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are servants of Him. We are servants of Christ, but even so, I know a lot of people have done this. You've probably have seen this, or maybe you've done it yourself. Some people take pride in their servitude to God. Look how much of a servant I am. Look what I've done for the Lord. All of a sudden, pride sneaks in, even in our servitude. Number four, think about our testimony. When we are tempted to say something, when we are tempted to do something, Stop and think before we do. Stop and think before we say because we need to also absorb how is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect people's view of my testimony? And my testimony is that I am saved by the grace of God. I am unworthy to be called a child of God. He makes me worthy because of His righteousness, not anything about what I've done, but what He's done. That's our testimony in Christ. By Him, Jesus Christ, Him crucified, died, resurrected, and He's coming back again to get me one day. Amen? Amen? That's our testimony. But when we act in the way the world acts, we nullify that testimony. We corrupt that testimony. We make it unworthy to people, unattractive to people. Why would I want to be like that? They're living just like the world does. There's no difference in them than me. What, what do they have that I ain't got? We ruin our testimony. We need to understand that the things that we do, the things that we say, people hear and people notice. Amen? And when we're not acting in the way that Christ wants us to act, it can ruin our testimony, but not just your testimony. Guess what? Because you call yourself a Christian, you also taint all Christians. You call yourself a member of a church. Guess what? Everybody in that church is now looks like you. How would you like that? To an unbeliever, we put ourselves in a fishbowl. They're watching us. And we can ruin our testimony by the things we say. And especially if pride creeps in, it can really ruin the testimony of the church. It can ruin the testimony of, you, of your faith in Christ. Number five, we need to stop and think about what we want now versus what we want most. What we want now versus what we want most. Is the gratification or even the glorification of myself now better than what I may receive in heaven? Matter of fact, what I will receive in heaven? Daniel Aiken, commentator, said this, The things of this world seem to be of great value, but they are worthless when compared to the eternal blessings that come from doing the will of God. 
If we can just step back and recognize that we are only passing through this world. We have an eternal home that's waiting on us. The eternal blessings of God that is waiting on us. And it's a guaranteed possession in heaven. The things of this world will pass away. We can try to gratify ourselves and gratify our flesh here on earth. But guess what? It is only momentary. It will only last for a little while. Is it worth it? What we want now versus what we want most. Let's transition to the temptation that Jesus experienced. There are, the temptation is the third temptation that Jesus experienced, probably not in the order that Luke presents. Matthew's gospel has the same story, but a different order of the, of the, te of the temptations, which is probably more chronological than Matthew's gospel. Nonetheless, Luke had a purpose in organizing it the way he did. This third temptation, though, was to exploit the promises of God and to boast in his own righteousness. That's the temptation that, that Satan tried to employ. Exploit. Exploit means to take advantage of the promises of God and to boast in his own righteousness. It was a prideful ploy. Satan is very crafty and smart, and he attempted to get, use Scripture and twist Scripture to get Jesus to act in his own self-interest. So the first thing I want you to note here is Satan misused Scripture to convince Jesus. He misused Scripture to convince Jesus. Well, how did he do this? He said, Satan you, and quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. And 11 and 12 of Psalm 91 says, I'm going to read it again for you. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their, with, in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I want you to notice something very carefully. Satan did not misquote Scripture. He quoted it verbatim. He just misapplied it. He misused it, misinterpreted it. Satan's really good at quoting Scripture. He can probably quote it front to back. He knows it better than we do. Amen? But he also knows how to misapply it. And he's very good at it. But let's read a greater portion of this context of Psalm 91 to see what the writer was talking about. The psalmist who wrote it was singing praises to God for those who seek refuge in the Lord, God's promises that he will protect them. In verse 9 of that same chapter, he says, If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near to your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will tre trample on the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now this is a great promise to those who take refuge in God. But the Jewish people did not understand this psalm to be a messianic promise. They did not see this psalm as a prophecy that the Messiah would fulfill. It wasn't a direct prophecy nonetheless. But this promise in this psalm... It's to everyone who has faith in God. New Testament reality is those who have faith in Christ, who is the embodiment of God's word. But the ultimate fulfillment of this promise, please understand this, and this is where Satan missed it, but Jesus got it. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise is not a physical or a literal salvation. It was spiritual. Because there is a greater danger for us than a physical danger. There's a greater danger for us than if we are in actual prison. There's a greater danger for us than if we are being pursued by an enemy. The greater danger is a spiritual danger, 
a danger that we could end up forever without God in hell. That's a true reality, and that is a spiritual reality, and that's what this psalm is referring to. Those who seek refuge in God will be permanently saved by God's right hand. Amen? That's the application of this scripture. But Satan wanted it to be a physical salvation. Hey, the promise, the promise says, Jesus, that if you take refuge in God, then if you just jump off this temple top, he says he's going to save you. Right? Well, don't you think that Jesus knew better? Jesus knew better. And he said, no, the Bible says don't test the Lord. But Satan, obviously, uh, he failed to mention verse 13. He, he said verse 11 and 12, but he didn't, he didn't read all the way through. He knew it, I'm sure. Verse 13, I'm going to remind you, it says, when you take refuge in God, it says, you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. When we take refuge in God, you know, Satan in Scripture is referred to as a great lion. He is a, a lion that prowls around looking for someone to devour. But he is, also, he is also symbolic of the great serpent. We see the serpent in Genesis and in Revelation. So we know the promise here that Satan ironically failed to mention that if we take refuge in God, the power of God overcomes Satan himself. Amen? If you are the Son of God, notice what Satan, what Satan says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, then you must, then God will fulfill these conditions. You meet the conditions of taking refuge in Him. Your righteousness requires that God act on your behalf. Just throw yourself off here. God will save you. He must protect you. That's His promise. But what did Jesus answer with? Number two, Jesus appropriately applied Scripture to counter Satan. Jesus knew the proper application of Scripture. And if anyone had the right to exert his own righteousness, Jesus was the one. He is the only righteous one. Yes, we are considered righteous before God, not because of what we've done, but if Scripture says because we have believed in God, our belief in God, specifically the belief in the true God, the Trinity, and what Christ has done on the cross, the belief in God is what makes us righteous. God imputes His righteous to us. That's, a, that's the biblical theological word. And imputes just means transfers. We don't have righteousness in and of ourselves. It's not like we earned it, but... Christ's righteousness is transferred to us because of the cross and our belief in Him. And likewise, our sin was transferred to Him on the cross. There is an exchange that's happened because of the cross. But Christ was the only righteous one. But anyone who inflates his own righteousness suddenly deflates it. Let's get that. As Christians, we have the right to be called children of God because He has made us so, not because we have earned it. But notice what Jesus does. He doesn't simply quote a passage to Satan. He applies a passage to Satan. Simply quoting a Bible verse or simply quoting it, well, you can quote all day long because Satan's going to quote right back. But how about applying what you know? Apply what you know to be true of Scripture. Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, in all three temptations, Jesus quoted from the Old Testament, but he actually quoted from a very small section of the Old Testament. It was all in Deuteronomy, and it was all from chapter 6 to chapter 8. And, and strangely enough, it was all three of those instances, from Deuteronomy chapter 6 to chapter 8, was in context of Moses giving the commands of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. And where was Jesus at the time of testing? Whew. And where was Jesus at the time of testing? In the wilderness. Am I going too quick? Let me start over. Lucy was a strong believer in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
Jesus quoted from the Old Testament all three temptations for Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6 through 8. But Deuteronomy 6, 16 is the particular verse that he quotes in this passage. And let me read you the whole verse from Deuteronomy. He says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did in Massa. Moses is speaking from, on God's behalf to the people of Israel. And he was reminding them of an instance in Exodus chapter 17. It's the, the incidents when they were wandering in the wilderness. This is before they actually got to the promised land. They just got out of Egypt. They saw all the miracles of Egypt. They saw the Red Sea, the Red sea part, and they were walking their way there. And they were thirsty. And they stopped at this place. And they're like, Moses, you bring us out here to die and die of thirst? And of course, to complain against Moses is to complain against the one who put Moses in charge, which was who? God. So they complained against God here, and then God said through Moses, all right, Moses, see that rock over there? Go strike the rock, and water's going to spring out, and the people will be, uh, will be given water. And then Moses named the place, and he said, name the place Massa and Meribah, which means testing and quarreling, because they tested the Lord there. They tested God's provision. You see the, the irony, though? They had just seen these miracles in Egypt. They just saw the Red Sea split, and now they're worried. They're, they're discrediting God's character now, because now they're in the wilderness, thirsty, and they don't think, they don't trust God's provision, God's goodness, or God's promise, and they're like, we're going we're gonna to die out here to thirst. God can do all this stuff and do all this, but he can't, fit, he can't give us water? <laughs> they tested the Lord. So let's highlight this word test here for, for a minute. God was saying through Moses, do not test me through an examination process whereby you judge the true nature of me. It's not like you need to examine me again. I have proven myself trustworthy already. You should just trust me. The word test gives the understanding that the temptation that Satan was trying to use was, was wrong. It was not a proper testing of God. Lua and, and Nida, who are Greek scholars, and they define the Greek word test that Jesus used. And it means this. It says, to try to learn the nature or character of someone or something by submitting such to a thorough and extensive testing. And it means to test, to examine, to put to the test, or, to, or an examination. And the Hebrew word in the Old Testament means the same thing, to, to test, to prove the true nature of something. We, have a, we do not have the right to test God in this way. But we probably do so more often than we recognize when we test the promises of God. For Jesus to jump off the temple top and be saved here, he was going to test the promise of Psalm 91, but this will be an attempt to control or manipulate God because God must fulfill his promises, right? It was an attempt to manipulate God and to control God. Robert Stein said it this way, another, another scholar, he said, the temptation appears to have been to tempt God by putting him to the test, by forcing him to fulfill his promise of protection. True worship does not seek to dictate to God how, we must, how he must fulfill his covenantal promises. True worship does not seek to dictate to God how he must fulfill his promises. Let me give you layman's terms. God doesn't answer to us. David Gooding said it like this, the only motive for jumping off the temple top would either be vainglory or the desire to test God to see whether he would keep his promise or not. Scripture for, forbids man's testing a God in this way. God is not on probation. There is no doubt about his faithfulness. That has to be cleared up by putting him through more tests. You get that? The motivator behind such a temptation seems to be pride. And it's seen in a number of ways. Stay with me just a little bit longer. Lunch is on the way. You don't worry. 
the pride sneaks in. Because it is an attempt to control and manipulate God as if God has to prove himself to us again and again upon our command. That's the pride. Another reason pride sneaks in. He says when Jesus was on the temple top, on the rooftop with Satan, there were probably people around on the ground. And they may have been there to witness this miracle. And so for Jesus to jump and be rescued by angels, it would have been a clear sign this was the Messiah. But God did not want to prove his Messiahship in this way. Perhaps a resurrection would do better. (laughs) Here's a modern day example of some of this prideful situation that we can find ourselves in. A father named Jed promised his daughter, Ellie Mae, that he would always protect and provide for her. And he did so again and again, and he had the means to do so because he just ran into a big pile of money. He demonstrated protection by rescuing his child from danger. He rescued her from a snake that was about to strike her, provided food for her, shelter, clothing, and the list can go on and on. However, Ellie Mae just just couldn't wrap her mind around his... his, uh, his character and his promise. And so she continued to test him time and time again. And so one day she decided to go to the big city right near Beverly Hills. She stole a car and then expected her daddy to come to her rescue and bail her out. This would have been an abuse of the promises of her father, right? You remember the story of Ricky and Lucy? Let's finish it. Ricky prayed and asked God to heal his wife. Well, God did not heal Lucy, not in the way Ricky wanted anyways. However, God did speak to Ricky, and this is what he said. Ricky, you need to know something. I did heal Lucy, but not in the way you expected. But trust me, Lucy is healed. I love Lucy, too. And she was with me now because she had faith in me. Ricky, you were testing me. You were testing my goodness, my mercy, my promises. You were testing my power, my existence, and my love. You don't trust me, even though... I have given you so many good things and so many blessings that your head would spin had I listened them all. Let me tell you, let me ask you, Ricky, what God, what ruler, what father would give up their own son for you or for a sinner like you? I would, and I did. But your pride and arrogance blinds you, Ricky. They blind you to the truth. They persuade you to believe the lie that I am not real and simply do not care. Your pride makes you believe that you know what is best and that I answer to your commands. Not so. I love you too, Ricky. And I love you too much to give you a false sense of hope and pandering to your pride. You want me to prove myself? Well, then stop looking forward to what I can and will do for you and start looking backward backward to what I have done for you. You're not wrong to look for proof. You're just looking in the wrong direction. Father, I'm not sure anyone here today in their salvation, but you know. And I know that sometimes, Lord, We can fall into this sin of pride and it can blind us deeply to distrust you and your promises and to misunderstand what you have deemed right. And God, I pray you would help us to to lay down our pride and ourselves before you, to submit ourselves to you, Lord. You know what needs to happen in our lives. And Lord, Lord, there's a lot of things in this world that we just can't comprehend and wrap our mind around. But God, we know we can trust you 
because you have proven yourself over and over and over again that you are more than trustworthy. Help us to understand that. You don't need further testing to prove your goodness. If you've never done, if you, or if you never do anything else good for us on this earth, what you've done so far is way too much. But Father, we continue to struggle with this because we are feeble and weak-minded and it's hard for us to fully grasp who you are. It's hard for us to grasp your plan sometimes. But God, help us to learn to trust you. And I pray for anyone here this morning that needs to receive you as personal Lord and Savior that they would do so today to surrender their life to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.